Turn with me in the Holy Scriptures this morning to the 15th chapter of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 15. We're going to read together the first 31 verses. My text this morning is the first part of verse 28. The Word of God at Acts 15, verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought on their way by the church, They passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. And they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders. And they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. When there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye God? to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon, that's Simon, Simon Peter, hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles, upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Then pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. 
For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying, Ye must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent, therefore, Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which if ye keep yourselves, ye do well, fare ye well. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle, which when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation. There ends our reading of God's word this morning. May he add his blessing to our reading of the Holy Scripture. I direct your attention particularly to the opening words of verse 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. The words of our text were spoken at the conclusion of the meeting of the very first broader assembly in the New Testament church. The assembly that is often referred to as the Jerusalem Council or Jerusalem Synod. The meeting of this very first assembly of the church, broader assembly of the church, parallels our own broader assemblies, the meetings of the two classes, East and West, and the annual meeting of our synod, which took place a few weeks ago. What is said in the text of the decisions of the Jerusalem Council may, must, also be said of the decisions of the broader assemblies of true churches of Jesus Christ in our own day. So it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to decide. When the last decision is taken at the meeting of our synod, or the last decision prior to the adjournment of the meetings of the classes, as well as the conclusion of the monthly consistory council and deacons meetings of the local congregation. This must be said, so it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to decide. It was on this text that Herman Huxema preached in the very first pre-synodical worship service prior to the convening of the Synod of the Protestant Reformed Churches in 1940. Up until this time, the churches had only met as a combined classes. But on May 23, 1940, some 80 years ago, the very first Protestant Reformed Synod met at the Roosevelt Park Protestant Reformed Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Since the beginning of the existence of our denomination, God had blessed the churches with steady growth. 
through approximately 15 years of their history, they had experienced that growth, not only in numbers, but in congregations as well. So that now it was fitting for the churches to meet in a synod and to divide into two classes. Our text this morning speaks of a wonderful work of God the Holy Spirit in the broader assemblies of the church. There is a work of the Holy Spirit in the individual child of God, beginning with regeneration. There is a work of the Holy Spirit in the local congregation, particularly in the local congregation through the labors of God-appointed office bearers, pastor, elders, and deacons. But there is also a work of the Holy Spirit in the broader assemblies of the church. And that work of the Holy Spirit is on the foreground in our text this morning. I call your attention to the Spirit's work in church assemblies. Let's ask and answer three questions that develop the truth of the Word of God in our text. First of all, the Spirit's work in what? And that, of course, is in the broader assemblies. Secondly, his work what? What specifically is the Spirit's work in these broader assemblies? And then finally, his work how assured? How may we be assured in our own day of this gracious work of the Holy Spirit in the assemblies of our own Protestant Reformed churches. The occasion for the convening of the Jerusalem Council was a doctrinal controversy that raged in the early apostolic church. That doctrinal controversy is referred to in the opening verse of the chapter. And certain men, which came down from Judea, taught the brethren, came down to Antioch, that is, which is actually north of Jerusalem, but because Jerusalem was built on a hill, you always went down from Jerusalem and up to other cities. In any case, these brethren said, except ye be circumcised, ye Gentiles be circumcised. After the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. That controversy is also referred to in verses 5 and 6. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying, that it was needful to circumcise them. Them, of course, being the Gentiles, and to command them to keep the law of Moses. The reference there isn't to the Ten Commandments, but to all the civil and ceremonial laws that were a part of the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. How often has this not been the occasion for the gathering of the broader assemblies of the Church of Jesus Christ. Doctrinal controversy, division within the churches over doctrinal issues. How many synods and classes and church councils down through history have met in order to condemn false doctrine and to defend the truth of the Word of God. There were serious issues, there have been serious issues, before the broader assemblies of the Protestant Reformed churches these last few years. 
including the synod of our churches, which met this past June. God has used the broader assemblies, synods, and councils for the preservation of the truth in the churches. The controversy at this time concerned the Gentiles and the coming of the Gentiles into the New Testament church. We ought to understand clearly what the issue was before the Jerusalem Council. The issue was not, do the Gentiles have a place in the New Testament church? Are they to be received into the New Testament church of Jesus Christ as members? That issue had been settled long ago. References is made to that in verse 7 of the chapter. When there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Peter is referring there especially to his bringing of the gospel to Cornelius, the Gentile, and to his household, and to God's work of grace through the preaching of the apostle Peter for the conversion of Cornelius and his household. There could be no question about it. Pentecost and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit had made that plain. No question about it. That in the New Testament age, the Gentiles were to be accorded membership in the church of Jesus Christ. But the issue was, how? How are the Gentiles to be received into the church? Are they to be received as Gentiles, uncircumcised Gentiles, or... Are the Gentiles to be accorded membership in the church by way of circumcision? Must the Gentiles submit to circumcision, which was the case with God's people, the Jews, in the Old Testament? That was the issue. The end of verse 5 makes that plain. That it was needful to circumcise them. This was a critical issue. It was fundamentally a doctrinal issue. The seriousness of the issue is indicated by what we read in verse 11. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved even as they the issue concerned the free and sovereign grace of God. Is salvation by grace and by grace alone? Or is salvation by grace and works? The human work of circumcision. The issue concerned not only the grace of God, but concerned the cross of Jesus Christ. Justification, the work of Christ alone as the basis for our salvation or Christ's work and our own works, if only our work of circumcision. That was the issue. The issue concerned holiness of life as the appended decision, more about that presently, makes plain. Not only justification in the cross of Jesus Christ, but also sanctification that flows forth from justification. Justification as the basis for sanctification. Holiness, good works, but holiness and good works now not as meritorious, not as earning anything, but as gratitude. Gratitude to God 
for His free and sovereign grace. Gratitude to God for the saving work of our Lord Jesus Christ. So serious was the issue before the Jerusalem Council. That issue was considered, and that issue was settled by the Synod. The decision of the Jerusalem Council was that the Gentiles were to be received into the church as Gentiles. Verses 10 and 11 make that plain. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. That's also indicated that decision of the council at the end of verse 28. The first part is our text for this morning. The second part of verse 28 is, and to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. Not either the burden of circumcision. So the decision of the council was that the Gentiles were to be received as Gentiles. They were not to be circumcised. To that decision was added what we read in verses 20 and 21. But that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols, from fornication, from things strangled, and from blood. Now, why? Why was that appended? All of the things that are mentioned in verse 20 pertained to the Gentile worship of idols, of false gods. All of the things that are mentioned there, particularly the main, the first thing, pollutions of idols, all the other things belong to the worship of the idols. The fornication that's referred to there is not fornication generally. But prostitution in the service of the idol gods. That was always a part of the worship of the idol gods. One of the highest acts of devotion to the idol gods. Prostitution with priests and priestesses of these idols. And then the other things too. Things strangled and from blood. They all pertain to the worship of idols. So that. Even though the Gentiles were to be received into the church as Gentiles, the Gentiles must not live in such a way, number one, that they are tempted to return to the idolatry from which they had been delivered. And number two, that they live in the church without giving offense to their Jewish brothers and sisters. It is true that the Gentiles were not to be made into Jews and then to be received into the church as Jews by circumcision. But neither were the Jews to be made into Gentiles. Jew and Gentile must live in peace in the church, the one church of Jesus Christ. And now it is with reference to that decision and the appended decisions that we read the words of our text. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. Several important truths that have to do with the broader ecclesiastical assemblies come out in our text and in this passage. First of all, comes out here the necessity and the importance of the broader ecclesiastical assemblies. The broader ecclesiastical assemblies have an important, a vital role to play 
in the life of the church. It isn't just because we deem it to be of value that we have classes meetings and an annual synod, but that this is simply an invention of the church. Not at all. This is the will of God. And that becomes plain in the gathering of this first broader assembly, the Jerusalem Council. The local congregation at Antioch appealed to the broader assembly of the apostles and elders meeting at Jerusalem in order to settle a matter that could not be settled in the local congregation. At the same time, that doctrinal matter, which it was fundamentally a doctrinal issue, pertained not just to Antioch, but pertained to all of the churches, the churches in common. By appealing this matter to the Jerusalem Council, the congregation at Antioch showed that they were not merely interested in themselves as a local congregation, their own affairs in Antioch, but they had a concern, a vital spiritual concern for the church of Jesus Christ in all the world, true churches of Jesus Christ that had been established by means of the preaching of the gospel. That is the explanation, first of all, for the existence of the broader assemblies concern for the peace and unity of the churches of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the second place, the passage makes plain that this assembly was a representative assembly. The broader assemblies are representative in nature. Not like we think of our Congress. It wasn't the case that the delegates were bound to represent the opinion of the people, government of the people, by the people, and for the people, so that you cast your vote, not necessarily because this is the conviction of your own heart, but you know that this is the view of the majority of the people who have elected you and whom you represent. Not that, I say. The church is not a democracy. That's congregationalism, which is fundamentally independentism. Not that way, but the, church, uh, the broader assemblies of the church are representative in as much as elders and ministers representing all the congregations are gathered together in an assembly. They are sent. They are delegated to these assemblies. That was the case with the Jerusalem Council. Verses 2 and 3 indicate that. Paul and Barnabas are sent by the congregation at Antioch. And they are sent there to represent the church at Antioch. Verses 2 and 3. Even though there were only really two congregations represented at this assembly, the congregation at Antioch and the congregation at Jerusalem. The fact of the matter is that these two congregations represented the two main elements in the New Testament church. The Jews, the congregation at Jerusalem, and the Gentiles, the congregation at Antioch. The broader assemblies are also representative in nature because they are composed of office bearers all on a par with each other in deciding the issues before the assembly. 
In the Reformed churches, we speak of parity of office bearers. That was the case with the Jerusalem Council. The apostles did not make the decision. And now the elders and all the members must live with what the apostles decide. Paul doesn't insist on deciding this matter in Antioch by appeal to his apostolic office. Neither is it the case that although the elders are included in the assembly, they have a minimal role to play, not at all a decisive role. That's not the case. And Acts 15 makes that very plain. The elders are on a par with the apostles. Ministers and elders work together to resolve the issue that is before the council. And the elders have an equal voice in deciding the matter. Read the chapter on your own sometime today or this week. And then maybe have the children in your home. Keep track of how many times the elders are referred to in Acts 15. Several times. And in the end, it is an elder that gives the deciding speech that resolves the matter. And it is the voice of an elder to which all, including the apostles, give ear. That elder is James. James speaks. The James is not the apostle James. James has been beheaded. The one James, according to Acts chapter 12. The James here is the brother of the Lord Jesus who was an elder in the congregation at Jerusalem. And by the way, he is also the human writer of the epistle of James. James, the brother of Jesus. The elders speak. The elders have as much a voice as the ministers and apostles. And that's the way it ought to to be. It is that way in our assemblies, I'm happy to say. That was the case at the Synod this past summer. The elders spoke. The elders were listened to by the other delegates, including ministers at the Synod. Besides, the broader assemblies are also deliberative. Deliberative. That's an important aspect of the nature of the assemblies. That was the case with this Jerusalem Council. Decisions were made, binding decisions, but decisions were made only after there was a full and free discussion of all the issues that were connected to the matter that was decided, that took place at the Jerusalem Council. That's implied in verse 2, when it says that Paul and the others were sent there for to consider of this matter. The men did not merely come to the council to cast a vote, but they came to the council to deliberate. The broader assemblies of the church are deliberative in nature. There is a full and a free discussion before the vote is taken. The delegates listen. They're not there just to speak. They're there to listen to their fellow office bearers. To listen to what the elders have to say. To listen to what the other ministers have to say. The deliberations, for that reason, must be conducted in an orderly manner. 
That was the case at the Jerusalem Council. It wasn't a free-for-all. It wasn't like the New York Stock Exchange, everyone screaming louder than the person next to them. It wasn't that. The meeting was conducted decently and in good order. One spoke, one at a time, while all the others listened to their fellow office bearer. After careful deliberation and a full and free discussion of the issue, a decision was taken. The decision arrived at by the Jerusalem Council was a unanimous decision. The first part of verse 25 indicates that. It seemed good unto us being assembled with one accord to decide. And that belongs to the goal of a full and free deliberation of the issue. Hopefully to bring the matter to a unanimous resolution. I'm happy to say that so far as I can recall, although there were weighty matters before Synod 2020, protests and appeals, that every decision was unanimous. That spoke loudly to me. Every decision was unanimous. Now that isn't always possible. It isn't possible in a consistory, it isn't possible at classes, it isn't possible at synod. And then the majority vote prevails. What the majority decides is the decision of the assembly. And in the fourth place, we learn from the passage not only the necessity and importance of the broader assemblies, not only that they are representative in nature, and not only that they are deliberative. Now in the fourth place, we learn that their decisions are settled and binding decisions. That was the case with the decisions of the Jerusalem Council. It was in the full consciousness of this that the brethren in Antioch received the decision of the assembly. And when the apostles and elders brought this decision to other of the local congregations, this is how they regarded the decision of the assembly as settled and binding. We learn that from Acts 16, verse 4. Now we have the beginning of the second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. And we read in Acts 16, verse 4, and as they went through the cities on the second missionary journey, they delivered them the decrees for to keep. The reference there is to the decisions of the Jerusalem Council. They are decrees that must be kept by the members that were ordained, ordained of the elders, of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. The decisions are settled and binding decisions. The decisions are not merely friendly advice, take it or leave it, not that, but they are subtle and binding decisions. That's what our church order says about the decisions of the broader assemblies. The church order is in the back of the Psalter, and if you refer to Article 31 of the church order, Article 31 says, if anyone complain that he has been wronged by the decision of a minor assembly, he shall have the right to appeal to a major ecclesiastical assembly. And whatever may be agreed upon by a majority vote, 
shall be considered settled and binding. That's impressed upon ministers of the word, elders and professors of theology when they sign the formula of subscription. This really is how the formula of subscription ends. The formula too is found in the back of the Psalter, the very last printed page, most likely. At the very end of the formula of subscription in the purpose of the formula is that all office bearers sign it expressing their agreement with and support of the confessions of the church. They're subscribing themselves to our Reformed confessions. And it says there, um, we reserve the right of appeal whenever we shall believe ourselves aggrieved by the sentence of the consistory classes or synod, and until such a decision is made upon such an appeal, we will acquiesce in the determination and judgment already passed. Settled and binding are the decisions of the broader assemblies. Then there mustn't be a group that takes it upon itself, the right as a group to scrutinize and criticize publicly the decisions of the broader assemblies. A self-proclaimed committee five or committee six of Senate to do such a thing is schismatic. To do such a thing is despicable behavior in the church of Jesus Christ. The decisions of the assemblies are settled and binding decisions. This is how we must view the decisions of the Synod 2020. This is the reformed way. The autonomy of the local congregation and at the same time the binding character of the decisions of the broader assembly. Two errors must be rejected. First of all, the error to be rejected is that the broader assemblies are inherently evil and that there mustn't be broader assemblies. This is the thinking of many today. This is their explanation often for evil in their denomination, for the countenancing of evil practices and false doctrines in their denomination. It's the fault of the classes. It's the fault of the synod. It's the fault of the general assembly. And they suppose to excuse themselves as though those institutions are inherently evil. We must get rid of them. We must be done with classes. We must be done with synod. We must be done with the general assembly. That's a mistake. A serious mistake that is contrary to the will of God as it is expressed in Acts 15. Great good, amazing good has come from the broader assemblies in the churches. Think of the good of the Jerusalem Council. Acts 16 verse 5 speaks of that. And so were the churches established in the faith, and increased in number daily. Down through history, God has repeatedly used the broader assemblies for the good of his church. Call to mind the early church councils and ecumenical synods that decided the truth of the Trinity and settled the Christological controversies, establishing the deity and the real humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Think of the Council of Nicaea and the great Nicene Creed that came out of that council in 325 AD. Think of the great Synod of Dort, the great good that came out of that synod for the churches not only of the Netherlands at that time, but for the good of the church of Jesus Christ down through history from that moment forward. What great good 
the decisions of that synod that met long ago in 1618, 1619 for our own Protestant Reformed churches. Down through history, God has used the broader assemblies for the defense of the truth, for the promotion of the gospel. And that has been the case in our own history as churches. Congregations torn by division, ravaged by doctrinal controversy, have been rescued. Beleaguered pastors and consistories have been upheld and defended. Wrong and oppressed saints have been delivered and have been vindicated by the assemblies. The truth has been defended from its detractors and deniers and peace. And doctrinal harmony has been preserved in the denomination by wise biblical judgments on the part of the classes and the synod. The second error that is to be rejected is the denial today on the part of individuals and consistories for responsibility for the decisions of the broader assemblies. That too goes on today. The decisions of the broader assemblies are settled and binding. That implies the responsibility on the part of all whom the broader assemblies represent for the decisions of the broader assembly. That's denied today. It's the synod that has made all those bad and wrong decisions. And they refuse to recognize any culpability, any responsibility for those bad decisions. You see, in our congregation here, we have a good minister. And we're a conservative congregation, so it doesn't matter what the Senate or the General Assembly has decided. We wash our hands of any responsibility for the decisions of the broader assemblies. Women in office, that's the decision of that bad Senate. We don't subscribe to that in our congregation. The countenancing of divorce and remarriage for every reason, well, that's the decision of the broader assembly. But that's not our decision personally and individually. The countenancing of homosexuality, of the dread air of the federal vision, that's the decision of the broader assemblies. We don't take responsibility for that. We don't share in those decisions. You're wrong. They're wrong. They are responsible. They are culpable. For you see, the broader assemblies are representative in nature. The churches in the broader assemblies bear responsibility for the decisions that are taken. And that's what the apostles said too. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us, all of us, we too are responsible for the decision of the assembly. It was the decisions of the broader assembly of the apostles and elders at Jerusalem concerning which the words of our text then were spoken. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. What does that mean specifically? What work of the Holy Spirit in the assembly was the reason for the confident assertion for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. What the delegates of the Jerusalem Synod were confident of, of course, was that their decisions were approved by God. That certainly is how their assertion is to be understood. For it seemed good to God the Holy Ghost. They were sure that they had made the right decision. 
They were sure of God's blessing upon that decision. With a good and clear conscience, the delegates of the Senate could stand before God himself regarding the decisions that they had taken. We also had better be able to do that. Every consistory member, every delegate to classes, every delegate to synod. So it seemed good to God and to us. The explanation for that confidence is the consciousness that the decisions that they had taken were according to God's word. That's the critical thing. And that's what it means when they said, for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost. Not good to the Holy Ghost by some mystical and mysterious work of the Holy Ghost. Some yes with an exclamation point in the clouds in the heavens. Some voice of the Holy Spirit who spoke directly on the assembly of the Jerusalem Council, expressing concurrence with the decision that had been made. Not any of that. Rather, it seemed good to the Holy Ghost because the decision that they had taken was according to sacred scripture. That's why. And that was the case. Good to the Holy Ghost who has inspired the scripture. And that's what decided it at the council. That's verses 15 through 17. I don't have time to say much about that. 15 through 17, now James speaks up. And when James speaks up, he says, And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written. So he's demonstrating from Scripture, the Old Testament Scripture, that the Gentiles were to come into the church as Gentiles, not as Jews. He's appealing to the Old Testament prophecy of Amos, Amos 9, verses 11 and 12. You can look at that on your own too when you reread the chapter. He's appealing to Scripture, is James, to demonstrate what the decision of the assembly must be. That appeal to Holy Scripture carried the day at the assembly, and it must carry the day at every church assembly. Only then, when the revealed word of God, when the decisions taken are in harmony with the revealed word of God, can the delegate say, so it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. And there's the connection too between those two parts of the text. This is the idea of the text. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost, and therefore also to us. The main thing is, it seemed good to the Holy Ghost, as the Holy Ghost who inspired Scripture has made plain. And because it seemed good to the Holy Ghost, it also seemed good to us. Only then can the delegates be confident that the decision that they took upheld the gospel, glorified the free grace of God, defended the cross of Jesus Christ in all its efficacy and power, defended the calling of every believer to walk in holiness of life because the decisions taken are according to Scripture. That points out the great work of the Holy Spirit in the church assemblies. The Spirit, you see, is the Spirit of truth. The Spirit of Pentecost is the Spirit who leads the church into the truth. He leads not only individual believers into an understanding of the truth, He leads the church as church into an understanding of the truth. He does that through the broader assemblies. The Spirit is present. 
The Spirit is at work in the broader church assemblies to cause the men who are assembled to know what is good and what is right. And his work is to incline their hearts to decide that which is good and that which is right. Oh, a warning. A serious warning to those who disdain the broader assemblies, who thumb their nose at the decisions of the broader assembly. They are thumbing their nose at the Holy Spirit who is pleased to work through the broader assemblies. So does this mean that the broader assemblies can never err, that the decisions of classes and synod are infallible? Of course not. Of course not. Bad decisions have been made by broader assemblies in the past, still today, even in the recent past of our churches. The Reformed churches recognize that very real possibility. They recognize that very real possibility in their jealousy to defend the right of protest and appeal. That's the basis for that sacred and God-given right, protest and appeal, the very real possibility that the assemblies may have erred. And then, in the orderly way of protest and appeal, decisions can be reviewed. Bad decisions can be reversed. And that which was done in error can be corrected. That's the way protest and appeal. Nonetheless, what the text teaches clearly and what history proves is that it pleases the ascended Lord Jesus Christ to rule over and in his church through the broader assemblies. Finally, how may we be assured of this work of the Holy Spirit. His presence, his guiding of the broader assemblies of Synod 2020. We may have this assurance first by being resolved by the grace of God to subject all our decisions to the searching light of God's word revealed. That means that the basis for every decision must not be our own fleshly desires, not our own personal ambitions, certainly not our own private agenda. That's despicable, but we must be motivated by what pleases God. Not what pleases the people, not what will be popular in the churches, not what is the easiest way to go, the least painful the path of least resistance, then we will never be able to say, so it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. Consciously, we must be firmly resolved to subject every decision to the revealed Word of God. That's the standard. And, of course, our Reformed confessions as summaries, faithful summaries of the teaching of the Word of God. In the second place, we may have the assurance of the guiding and approval of the Spirit of Christ as we seek that guidance. It must be sought by the churches for the synod. And it must be sought by the delegates to the synod, to the classes meetings. The fundamental truth here is that God will give his grace and Holy Spirit only to those who ask them of him and are thankful for them. It doesn't just apply to the individual child of God. That applies also to the broader assemblies with a view to that pre-synodical prayer service 
is always held. In view of that, every session of Synod, every morning session, every afternoon session, if there's an evening session, every evening session begins, closes with prayer and the reading of Scripture and the work of the committees always also begins and closes with prayer. Consciously, we depend upon the Holy Spirit, the direction, the illumination of the Holy Spirit. That's the way. In that way, when synod is adjourned, when all the delegates have returned to their own congregations, we may be able to say, so it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. Amen. Father in heaven, bless thy word and the instruction of thy word to our congregation, to each of us individually, we pray this morning. We are dependent upon thee and upon the spirit of thy son, our Savior, Christ Jesus. Continue to bless and to use for good in our own denomination the meetings of the broader assemblies. Thus, may we continue to experience thy blessing and peace among ourselves. For Christ's sake, amen.